It's been called an open-air prison, one of the most densely populated places on Earth. But what is Gaza really like for those who live there? And why is such a tiny, impoverished territory once again the focus of global attention? Gaza is a strip of land just 40 kilometers long and 10 kilometers wide. You could walk its length in eight hours. It sits in the southwest of Israel and also shares a border with Egypt and has one of the highest population densities in the world, more than 5,700 people per square kilometer. Around 2 million Palestinians call Gaza home. Roughly half of them are children. Gaza's history stretches back to ancient times, but its people now are facing one of their darkest moments. Gaza had been blockaded by Israel and Egypt for a number of years. Access by air and sea is closed by Israel. Even fishermen have limited freedom. Fortified fences also separate Gaza from Israel and Egypt, which control the only two border points for people who need to cross, Erez and Rafah. These crossings are also used to transport goods. Many Gazans have lived their whole life without leaving. It means that access to basic goods are often in short supply, a situation now made worse, with water and power severely disrupted by Israel's military response to the Hamas attacks that included closing the Erez crossing and airstriking Rafah, the exit to Egypt. We are lacking simply everything. People in Gaza lack food, lack uh, medical supplies, like, uh, lack humanitarian aid, and also lack of supply. So if the escalation is going to be continued, we are heading absolutely towards a humanitarian crisis. For years, tunnels running from Gaza under the border with Egypt have been used to bring in everything from cigarettes to food. Since taking control of Gaza, it's believed Hamas have expanded this vast underground network for gunmen to hide and be resupplied with weapons. Gaza has been under a blockade um, for the past 16 years, one six, which is also why uh, the number of people who rely on the UN Refugee Agency for the Palestinians um, has increased massively over the past few years. So, if, for example, 1.2 million people rely on our food assistance, which we had to stop because of the escalation. Um, a, a lot of people go to our schools. In fact, 300,000 children go to our schools. The levels of poverty have reached more than 60 percent. So already before the 7th of October, the situation has been very, very difficult. All of which has led the United Nations to call for lifting the blockade on Gaza. So why doesn't this happen? Any hopes of a de-escalation in the conflict between the Israeli government and Palestinians has been dashed these past days. The unprecedented scale of the attack by Hamas and its brutality has shaken the region. Israel, governed by its most hardline coalition in recent years, is facing off against Hamas in Gaza. It's a militant group that took power in 2007 and has regularly launched rockets into Israel since then. And Hamas has few allies, save Iran and other militant groups in the Middle East. There have not been free and fair elections in Gaza in over 15 years. Activists are, right, are routinely uh, uh, arrested and, and, and disappeared for speaking out against the regime. So th there's, no, there's no pretense that Gaza is any kind of democracy. However, the public opinion polls generally show that whenever there's a war raged against Gaza, against Hamas, Hamas's support rises in the polls. So why now? The horrific events of the past days took everyone by surprise. Israel was supposed to have one of the most advanced military and intelligence operations in the world. Gazans often complain of the incessant buzz of drones hanging over them. While many thought a new era of Arab-Israeli peace had been achieved, with a number of countries signing historic peace treaties in recent years, no one saw this unprecedented violence coming. And yet, all the signs were there. Even before these events, 2023 looked set to be the deadliest year for Palestinians in two decades, with attempts to create a Palestinian state alongside Israel going nowhere. 
In the West Bank, the other major home to Palestinians, the Israeli government has furthered the expansion of settlements for Jewish people, leading to frequent clashes with Palestinians who'd lived there. The settlements are deemed illegal under international law, but Israel rejects that. Then in Jerusalem, a city holy to the world's three largest religions, the Muslim community has become increasingly angered by unagreed visits to Al-Aqsa Mosque, a sacred site also for Jewish people who call it Temple Mount, leading to violent clashes with Israeli police. It's the holy building that's given the name to Hamas's operation, Al-Aqsa Flood. Now, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has vowed mighty vengeance on the militants, launching nearly 4,000 airstrikes into Gaza's packed neighbourhoods in the 72 hours after Hamas started their brutal attack. The United Nations has called for humanitarian access to Gaza and the protection of civilians. I am deeply distressed by today's announcement that Israel will initiate a complete siege of the Gaza Strip, nothing allowed in, no electricity, food, or fuel. We do understand that in order to bring Hamas to a phase of defeat, we will probably need to create a huge economic and humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where hundreds of thousands of people might starve and might not have not only energy and gasoline, but also water and food. And only pressure like this might bring to something that Israel will be able later to say, we took all the measures, we win this enemy, and anyone else who will try us will face a very similar result. Leaving us with the difficult question, if failed negotiations, hardline politics, and harsh living conditions in Gaza brought us to this position, can a severe military operation by Israel inside Gaza bring anything better?